Good morning, Southside Community Church. We are very happy that you're watching online. We are looking forward to very soon being together as a spiritual family again here in our sanctuary. But right now we're praising God for the internet and that you can be at home watching in the healthy safety of your home with your computer, your laptop, your iPad, whatever you're watching on. So please participate in this service with your whole heart, with your whole soul. And I wanna invite you to stand at this moment and we together are going to pray and we're all going to ask the Holy Spirit to bless us in this worship service that he will make us feel not only his presence, his love, his healing, but also that we will feel the togetherness we do have in Christ, that we are one spiritual family in Christ. So let's pray. Father God, Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, we humbly come before you now and we ask you to bless us with your presence, your grace, that you will make us feel your love, your work, your mercy and grace in us, around us, working to make us holy, helping us to know you and your love. Lord, also please, we ask you, fill us with your Holy Spirit and enable us to be your people wherever we're at throughout Sacramento or even the United States. All, everybody who's watching this online, Lord, please make us one spiritual family in Christ that we would all feel the unity you have given us in Christ, in the Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, we ask you to help us worship, help us give glory to Jesus Christ. And we pray this in your holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Southside. Um, it's a nice, it's a beautiful Sunday morning here. And you know, God oftentimes uses symbol and metaphor to convey a deeper spiritual truth in our lives and about the kingdom of heaven. In the Old Testament, the symbol that he chose to use was the Ark of the Covenant. And what the Ark of the Covenant did is it symbolized God's presence with the, the children of Israel. And so when they went into battle, you know, as long as they were following closely and, and they knew they had the Ark of the, uh, the Covenant, they were assured of victory. We live in the age of, a, of the New Testament, or the New Covenant. And really, our symbol that we have now is the Holy Spirit. We know that the Holy Spirit lives in us, and we also know that the Holy Spirit is with us, to guide us, to correct us, to bring us into the victory that He has for us. So as we sing this song, Presence, we can maybe imagine that the Ark of the Covenant is with us. But the reality is, is that the Holy Spirit is with us and in us. And He desires to illumine our minds. Oh, Lord, and fill up my 
Lord, it's my desire. Lord, it's my desire. Lord, you're my desire. I want to feel your presence. I want to feel your presence. Come, oh Lord, and fill up my life with the light of your presence. This is my heart's desire. Lord, it's my desire. Lord, it's my desire. Lord, you're my desire. Lord, it's my desire. Lord, it's my desire. Lord, you're my desire. Lord, you're my desire. Awesome. Amen. You know, this next song is called Resurrection Power. And I really like this one phrase. It says, I'm dressed in your royalty. Your Holy Spirit lives in me. I see my past has been redeemed. The new has come. It really speaks of the newness and the freshness that God wants to bring in our lives. And if we belong to him, then we have that very power that raised Jesus from the dead to help us to cope in difficult circumstances, to help us to uh, live um, above our circumstances. And it's, it's the very resurrection power that lives within us is the power that raised Jesus from the dead. That's a powerful thing, a very powerful thing. me from the grave by name You called me out of all my shame I see the old has passed away The new has come Now I have resurrection power Living on the inside tree Freedom, you have given us freedom. 
blessed in darkness, living in the light of your goodness. You have given us freedom, freedom. You have given us 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 freedom. Amen. You know, our next song is called Our God Says. In, in a way, it's kind of a theological treaty. It, it, it mentions the Father. It name, mentions the Son. And it mentions the Spirit. And in those three personalities, we have the Godhead. And if we have the Holy Spirit living in us, that means we have one of those beings of the Godhead living in us. That means we have deity that's living in us. It's a living, active power. It's power source that created the universe. It's a power source that gives us our sunlight. It's the power source that gives us our breath, everything that we see, touch, feel. And that's an amazing statement because there is nothing on earth that can create that power source except God living in us. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come, we gather together. To lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall in your grace. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. We gather together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall in your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering. As your saints bow down, as your people say, we will rise with you, lifted on your wings, and the world will see that our God says. Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come, we gather together to lift up your name, to call our Savior, to fall in your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down, as your people say, We will rise with you, lifted on your Your name 
God says, our God says, our God says, our God says, our God says. I think this is the point in our service uh, where we prompt for tithes and offerings. This is a beautiful day the Lord has made. And, and in our country today, even though we're still dealing with the effects of the COVID-19 virus and people have started returning to more normal lives, it's still not completely normal, even here in our country. And it is not even close to being normal in the rest of the world. This last week, I've heard from two of our missionaries that we support that Bible translators in different parts of this world are now starving because they have no food. Their cities, their villages, their towns have no food. The supply chains have completely broken down because of the COVID-19 virus. And so I want to invite you to pray and give as God you know, stirs in your own heart that we can give an extra gift to help our Bible translators and to help those in need. Not just here in Sacramento. I mean, we help the homeless here, and, and I praise God that we can do more for that. But at this very moment, there are men and women and families starving, and we can do something about that. We can be the hands and feet of Jesus. So I thank God for you, for your sacrificial giving, your faithful giving, your generous giving. I thank God for you because of your love for Jesus and your love for Southside Community. So I'm, I'm very grateful to you, and I want to invite all of us at this moment to lift our hearts to God and ask him, Lord, what would you have us do? Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we are so blessed here in this country. Lord, most of us have cars that work. Most of us have roofs over our heads. Most of us have food in a refrigerator and in pantries. Lord, you have richly blessed us. But we have brothers and sisters in need, literally in starvation. So Lord, please speak to our hearts, speak to our minds, and guide us that we may be your love, your hands and feet, your ministers of your holy gospel, and that we may love in action, not just in word. Lord, please take all that we can give you now through this offering, that everyone that is watching this could give even sacrificially, Lord, and that we could in turn bless and help those who are starving. And we pray this in the powerful, holy, loving name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. This next song is called Your Love Never Fails. It's really a, a song that describes to us that God never lets us go. Even though difficulties may come into our lives, even though we may be having a tough season or a tough run, he's still there. And as I mentioned earlier, the Holy Spirit is what resides in us and it helps us to cope, even through difficult circumstances. We know that we have that strength. We know that we can have that power source. All we need to do is really draw upon that. And as we draw close to God in prayer, as we read his word, as we fellowship as much as that we can he uses that and he fills our hearts he fills us up so that we can share that love that we've experienced and as Steve mentioned earlier there are a lot of different ways that we can love each other so as we've been loved <clears throat> we have the opportunity to love others Don't make me 
mistakes, but you have new mercies for me every day. Your love never fails. You stand the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the Far too wide. I never thought I'd reach the other side. Your love never fails. You stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. Rage. I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me Your love never fails You make all things work together for my good You make all things work together for my good same through the ages your love never changes there may be pain in the night but joy comes in the morning and when the oceans rage i don't have to be afraid because i know that you love me your love never fails For my good, you make all things work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good. Uh, amen. That's all we have right now. Stay, keep in touch. Just give me one second, and I'll be right up there. Good morning. It's great to be with you. Uh, I am excited to share this message with you uh, for a number of reasons. Number one, God gave it to me. Number two, I think these, I'm going to do a series of messages on the Holy Spirit, and these messages, these truths come from God. These are spoken from God to his people, and this is how we are to live, is to make us completely different than the world. And if there's one thing that is very evident to me in our country today and in the world today, we do truly need to be living differently. But how? In our own power, in our own thinking, we don't have the ability. But God, in his perfect love for us, has given us the ability. He's given us himself. And we talked about that when we talked about the day of Pentecost, when God gave the Holy Spirit, He gave Himself. And so I want to start reading with you in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. And we're going to look at the miracle of living in the Holy Spirit. And we're going to start this today, and we're going to continue this for just a few weeks. But the, the power of this is living day to day in every moment. In, in your good moments and in your worst moments. How can you live 
as God intends us to fully experience him and know him and his love and his peace and all the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is love and joy and peace, kindness, gentleness, all the fruits of the Spirit. Let's start reading in Ephesians 5, verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. I, I don't care how old you are. God, at this moment, wants you to know you in Christ, through faith in Christ. You are his beloved child. And walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us as an offering and sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Do not let immorality or any impurity or greed even, even be named among you as is proper among saints. Saints are different than normal people. We're extraordinarily different. That's what God wants us to be, saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of God. That should cause all of us to reflect, to think soberly. Where is my soul truly as God looks at me? Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Not in yourself, but in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light consists of all goodness, Goodness from Jesus Christ, not goodness of the world. And righteousness and truth. Jesus Christ is the truth. Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And do not participate in unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. For all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. For everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason, it says, the scriptures say, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise making the most of your time because the days are evil. Let me read those two phrases again. Therefore, be careful how you walk. Be careful how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. In evil days, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus taught us about the Holy Spirit. He actually taught a lot about the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 3, verse 34, he said that God gives the Holy Spirit without measure. You and I have never in our lives been able to give any gift without measure. Whatever you give has a measurement. 
If I give uh, one of my family members, a niece or a nephew who's graduating from high school or college, a gift, it's definitely got a limit. You know, I'm not giving them you know, a check that has no dollar limit because I don't have that ability and neither do you. So the Holy Spirit is given by God without measure. In, it's infinite. God is infinite. Rejoice in that for a second. That God loves you that much, he gives himself to you without measure in an infinite way. Jesus also taught us that the water, the Holy Spirit that he gives, this is in John chapter 4 and John chapter 7, is leaping up to eternal life. He talked about like a fountain that springs up, and it doesn't just spring up like a, a small water fountain, but we're talking about like Niagara Falls. Now, if you can imagine Niagara Falls being blown up into the sky 3,000 feet and cascading back down, that's a small picture of what God is talking about with the Holy Spirit leaping up in an infinite measure to eternal life. God isn't just giving you a cup of cold water when you're really thirsty. But he's giving us himself and without measure, and it's leaping up to eternal life. It's defying all the laws of physics and gravity. You and I can't do that. God alone does that, and he's leaping up to give you eternal life. And then only through Jesus and in the Holy Spirit can God be worshipped. John chapter 4, 24 when Jesus was talking to the Samaritan woman, he said, God is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and truth. Truth doesn't just mean objective words on a page. It means Jesus himself. We come to God through Jesus and in the Holy Spirit. The Father will give the Holy Spirit the paraclete, the helper, the mediator, the encourager, the one called alongside to help, our advocate, our comforter, our supernatural teacher of all that Jesus taught. That is who Jesus is promising that the Father will give in John chapter 14. And also in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we see more of a description of the Holy Spirit. In John 14, Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the paraclete. One who actually comes alongside, but he comes alongside in an act of partnership. He, he kind of grabs you, and you are the passive recipient of his grace, of his presence, of his goodness. He comes to us to help us. He comes to be a mediator between God and us, because we cannot enter the presence of God with our sinful flesh. He comes to encourage He's called alongside us to help us, especially when we cannot help ourselves. He is our advocate with the Father. In the book of Romans, we're told that the Holy Spirit is actually interceding, advocating for us continually. He is praying for us, even groaning so deeply that there are no words. That is how God loves you. That is how he is advocating for you, trying to help you even in this moment. God loves us all this much. And when we blow it, when we're sinful, when we're stuck in our own pride, and, and I've been there recently, you, you just, you're like a fly on, on a piece of fly paper. If you've, you've seen those old-fashioned fly strips that are just glue, and a fly comes along because the smell is attractive, and they get stuck on it, and then they die. In our pride, that's what happens to us. We get stuck thinking we're right, somebody else is wrong, and there we have a, a screaming match, a yelling fight. Uh, people in cars have uh, that syndrome. What do they call that? Road rage. Yes, thank you. Road rage. Uh, we could fall into that in a, just a split second because of our own pride. And recently I've been there, and, and God is encouraging me even in this moment that the Holy Spirit is here to help me when I'm stuck in my own sin, when I'm stuck in my bad habits, when I'm stuck in places I don't want to be because I put myself there. God is our comforter, our encourager, our helper, our mediator. He is supernaturally able to give us understanding that we can not only be freed by him, freed by Jesus Christ and his bloodshed on the cross, but even start to make healthy choices in a new way because of his guidance, because he helps us. He shows us a clearer path to walk instead of the one where we stumble and trip over 
the rocks that we put there in the first place. In John chapter 15, the Holy Spirit is told by Jesus to us that he is the witness for Jesus. We're called to be witnesses for Jesus to the whole world, to tell the world of Jesus' goodness and his love for all sinners, the forgiveness that he offers, the healing that he offers, but we have to listen to this. We have to listen to the Holy Spirit be witnesses to us before we can testify to others. The Holy Spirit bears witness of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit does convict of sin and righteousness the good and the bad, he makes very clear what is righteous according to God and what is sinful according to God. Without God making that clear to us, we wouldn't know what to do. We we would always choose what our sinful flesh desires. Am I wrong there? Can you relate to this? Don't you always want that one thing that you know isn't good for you, but you're going to choose it anyway? That's why God gave us himself the Holy Spirit to guide us, to disclose to us the right way to go. And in this process, in in John 16, 7 through 15, he not only guides us and discloses us the right way to go, the right thing to think, the right thing to feel, but he glorifies Jesus Christ in us and through us when we walk that path. We know God more intimately, more personally. We have more fellowship with God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit God reveals his glory to us and is glorified when we follow what the Holy Spirit is guiding us to disclose, what he's showing us, revealing to us, drawing us deeper into fellowship with Christ. Who would not want to walk more in the glory of God? That that reality gives me goosebumps, just realizing that in my sinful flesh, God is trying to, He is guiding in his love and his gentleness to guide me into more of his glory and less of my sin so that I truly am made holy by him because you and I both know by ourselves we say the wrong thing, we do the wrong thing, we think the wrong thing, we feel the wrong thing. We need the glory of God. We need the Holy Spirit. And then before Jesus ascended to heaven. In John chapter 20, Jesus did something remarkable. He gave the apostles the Holy Spirit by breathing on them. And the Holy Spirit wasn't given until the day of Pentecost. But what the disciples received when Jesus breathed on them, and remember, Jesus is glorified. He is risen from the grave, and he is in his glorified being. Now, he is no longer in a frail human flesh. He's in a glorified body. And he breathed on him, on them, with his glorified body, the Holy Spirit. The same way God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit breathed life into Adam in the beginning of Genesis. Now, the apostles were already living beings. What was Jesus doing in John 20 when he breathed life and peace into them? He commissioned them in the Holy Spirit as the promise of what God was going to give them in just 10 days. And God, through Jesus, made this as intimate as intimate can be because now they know when the Holy Spirit comes, this is given by God the Father, promised by Jesus. The Trinity is at work here. God the Father sends the Holy Spirit Jesus commissioned them. He made it personal and intimate. He breathed his breath on them, into them. They received this promise and this commissioning from God the Son, promising God the Father would send the Holy Spirit, and in 10 days he did. So Jesus breathed new supernatural life into the apostles, and that is what God wants to do for you. That's what God wants to do for me to breathe into us his life. Not simple human life, not mortal life, but eternal life, glorified life. As Paul mentioned when he was describing one of the songs, the deity of God, God wants to live in us. That is mind-boggling. So where do we start? If these are all things that Jesus taught, this is what God wants us to understand about God the Holy Spirit. 
Well, we have to start with the absolute basics here. And what I'm going to tell you right now, you've heard. If, if you've been in the church your whole life, you've heard these things probably 5,000 times. But it, this is the best reminder for us. And this is where we start. This is first base, if you will. We can't go anywhere else without going here. As a matter of fact, this is where we live our entire life in Christ every day. We start here moment by moment of every day. So where do we start first? According to the great commandment, from Old Testament to New Testament, this does not change. Say it with me. Love God. This is it. It's not loving yourself first. It's loving God first. It's not loving food. It's not loving your house. It's not loving your car. It's not loving whatever stuff you enjoy. It's not loving Netflix eight hours a day. It's loving God. We have to start there. As a matter of fact, in Romans chapter 5, I, I want to read this section. You might think this is a little weird, but bear with me for a second. In Romans chapter 5, God speaks to us of his love for us. So I want to read this in verses 3 through 8. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations. This COVID-19 pandemic is a literal tribulation. We exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. And perseverance, proven character, not character like people in the world, who we politely call characters. No, character that comes from God, the character of Jesus Christ himself, proven character of God, Jesus. And proven character brings hope, concrete assurance from God, not not promises from another politician. This is an election year. We're going to hear a lot of promises. God bless every person that puts their hat in the ring, so to speak, to run for office because they're, they're trying to serve. May we all pray for every one of them. Amen? Pray for all the men and women running for office. Pray for them. But our hope is in Jesus Christ. And hope from God does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And while we were still helpless, get this, while each one of us, you and me, were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrates his love toward us. This is where our love for God first is enabled. Your ability to love God comes because God first loved you when you weren't lovable, you were his enemy. You were an active sinner, but God loved you. Jesus gave his life for you. So we start with love for God. First John tells us in chapter 4 that we are able to love God because God loved us first. So we start with love. Not just a warm feeling. This is a concrete action. You and I are called by God to love him with action. We have to show God our love. We show God our love by how we treat him. Do we spend time with him? Do we spend time in his word? Do we spend time in prayer? Do we spend time serving him? Do we spend time loving and serving other people? Because this is all part of loving God. We're going to speak more on that in the coming weeks. But love for God is what we live every day. We start with love for God because he first loves us. And then we repent. And again, this is not a one-time act in our life of following Jesus. This is something we live every single day, morning, noon, and night. Even in the middle of the night, if you wake up in the middle of the night, that's a great time to repent. Seriously. You might think, well, I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm sleeping. Okay. Reflect. If you're awake for five minutes, you can reflect on your whole day. Did you lose your temper even once? Did you judge somebody negatively even for a split second 
That's a sin right there. You can reflect and confess it and repent, even laying in your bed at three in the morning. Turn your heart towards God with all your being. Mourn your own sin, your own guilt, your own helplessness. We frequently get bent out of shape. And, and I'm talking about we generically. We human beings, right? We frequently get angry or upset because of the sin of other people. And sometimes the sin of other people is very upsetting. We can agree on that. But I have had a, an understanding, a growing understanding recently that is bothering me quite deeply. You and I both know the, the story of Adam and Eve that God told us. This is true history. This is not a made-up fiction. True history. When Adam and Eve first sinned, all they did was what? Pick a fruit and eat it. That's all they did. They did not murder anybody. They didn't burn somebody's house down. They didn't steal a car, rob a bank. They didn't do any of the gross sins we can talk about, but we didn't, we're not going to. All they did was pick a piece of fruit and eat it. Make this connection with me. May the Holy Spirit cause us to truly grow in our hearts with understanding from Him. Every time I sin, even if it's invisible and nobody else in the world knows it, let's just say I, I quietly, invisibly, in a microsecond, judge another human being. For anything, right? It doesn't matter what I judge them for. If I judge them, I just sin. I just hurt all of creation and you the same way Adam and Eve did when they sinned. Because every sin brings death. Not just to you, but to the whole world. Every sin hurts other people. Every word that I speak, if it comes out of my mouth with anger or impatience or judgment, I've sinned and hurt somebody. Every small sin. That's why God lists the sin of gossip as an abomination. Did you know that? We normally think of murder. Whoa, that's the worst. Whoa, that's a horrible thing. People can get arrested and thrown in jail for their lives or even put to death for murder. That's, that's a serious crime. God hates gossip as much as he hates murder. We think it's a small thing, but every sin is not a small thing to God. So we need to mourn our own sin and, and not be so quick to judge our brothers or sisters for whatever they're doing. That doesn't mean that we don't care because the more we grow in Christ, the more compassion and empathy we have for all people, all sinners who are lost in, in slavery in their own sin. And we want them to be freed. No matter how bad a sinner they might be, we long for them to come to Christ and receive His healing and forgiveness and, and to be changed by God. But we start with mourning our own sin. And then that sorrow, that godly sorrow, leads us, draws us, impels us to walk closer with God in righteousness. It, it draws us to righteousness. It empowers us to live more righteously. Not to be self-righteous, actually to be more humble that each of us would be very 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 much more desiring to be with Jesus on his path of righteousness to be filled with the Holy Spirit and guided by his glory and not our own self will so sorrow leads to new life in God and in that new life in God gives us more zeal to pursue holy living that's 2 Timothy chapter 2 verses 19 to 22 that's a powerful phrase of the pursuit of holy living. Do we actually desire it? We, we want it so much that we'll run after it. We're per, we'll pursue it like you might have a, a lion you know, chasing a gazelle on an African plain for dinner, right? The lion's hungry. We're not pursuing a cheeseburger, right? We're not pursuing our own fleshly desires. We're pursuing holy living. 
not to make, us, not to make ourselves look better to other people, but because holy living brings us closer to God and we want that intimacy with Him. To be more in His presence, to be more in His love, to be more with Him, participating actively in knowing Him, even to use that expression in the biblical sense between a husband and a wife, in love. So we have love, we have repentance, and we have faith. Faith is love and trust and obedience to God. That's faith. If you have love for God but no obedience, you're lying. You have no faith. So faith in Christ means that you have love for Him and trust in Him and obedience to every word He speaks. So the righteous live by faith. That's Romans 1.17. The only way to please God is by faith. Hebrews 11.6. In Galatians 2.20 it says that we live by faith in the Son of God. The life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. And in 1 John 5, 4, it says that the victory that we live in today in Christ has overcome the world. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. The victory that God gives us is not going to be achieved by any political means. Now, God has given a freedom in this country to vote. God has given us freedom to even run for office. God has given us tremendous liberties in this country, and we should live in them in a righteous way, in a humble way. We should all be active voters. We should all participate in praying for our government, whether it's city, county, state, federal. We should be praying for them, not against them. We should be active in being good citizens, but that we're good is literally defined by the righteousness of Jesus Christ and not whatever standard might be in our community. Love, repentance, faith. This is where we start. So I want to ask you right now to, to grade yourself on a scale of, of zero to ten. Zero being zero, none, like it's gone, doesn't even exist. And 10 being absolutely perfect, like I am glowing with the, the glory of God. I'm walking in the greatest intimacy. I mean, I am so close to God that I can smell the holy incense from his altar before his throne in heaven, right? You are that close with God. That's a 10. I, I'm not there right now. I want to be there, but I'm not there right now. I'm not a zero. I'm not a 10. But I'm asking yourself to grade yourself right now. Where are you? in your heart, in your mind, in your soul, in your love for God. Give yourself a number. Where are you? Grade yourself. Don't be too hard. Don't be too gentle. Be real. Because God knows. Okay? So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Ooh, that's, that's pretty good up there, right? But if you're down a little lower, maybe you need to turn up that love a notch, right? Go from a lower number to a higher number. Love God more. And what about your repentance? Where are you at there? Zero, no repentance? Ten, man, I, I could not possibly repent because I'm repenting every second with every breath. I'm living in absolute dependence on God. I'm, I'm repenting of everything I've ever done, and I'm aware of all my sin, and I am in constant mourning over it, depending on God, enjoying His love and His grace and His mercy, See, that's the, the dichotomy here, that the more you depend on God in mourning over sin, the more grace he gives you. So, yes, you have tears of repentance, but God turns them tears of joy. So you, you repent your sin, but he gives you grace and you rejoice. So the mourning is turned by God to rejoicing. There's actually in the verse of, in the Old Testament about that. So where are you with your repentance? Low number, high number. Give yourself a grade. And then in your faith, in your love and trust and obedience to God. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Where are you at? And if you've got the sermon notes, you're writing notes at home, you might even write those numbers down next to each one of those. A, B, C, love, repentance, faith. Give your grade... Uh, an objective measurement here. Write it down so that you can begin growing. 
so that if you're a three, next week you can be a four. In the Holy Spirit. Because God longs for you to grow in Him even more than you do. And He will help you. This is a promise. God wants you to be as close to Him as God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are. They are one. And God wants you to be one with Him. I hope that this message, I pray that this message is a blessing to you. And I mean that with all my heart, that you don't just feel good about this, but that your whole soul is now being drawn closer to God. That's the blessing I'm talking about. That your whole being wants and desires to be closer with Jesus Christ, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because that's His desire for you. That's His desire for me. Let me close in prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you taught all three years that you were walking this earth and performing miracles, you continually taught about the Holy Spirit. And that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit was always working together, revealing God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit the whole time you were walking this earth, Lord Jesus. And even in your resurrection and ascension, you were all present, Father, Son, and Spirit. You are one God, and you've revealed yourself to us. Lord Jesus, I pray for every person watching and listening to this sermon right now that you will bless us by your power, by your sovereign will, and in all your grace and mercy to help us truly begin walking with your Holy Spirit, being filled with your Holy Spirit, and growing in this, growing in our relationship with you. And we pray this for your glory. Amen. I want to ask you to do me a favor real quick before we uh, conclude this message and sign off for this week. I want to ask you to uh, contact the church office this coming week. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, call or email the church office and let us know if you really, 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 really want to be back in the sanctuary here because even though there's a spike in numbers in Sacramento and around California and and I think almost every state in our country, there's a spike, there's an increase in the numbers of the COVID-19 virus. If you want, with all your heart, to come back here, and this is a desire that you think, you believe is coming from God and no other, no other place, if this is a desire in your heart from God, then we want to listen to the Holy Spirit and His guidance. It is my desire to do what is best for all of us, safely, with health. I do not want to infect one person with that virus, just because I want us to be here in the sanctuary. Churches in the past have been hotbeds of of people becoming exposed to the virus, and I never want that to happen here. So I'm inviting you, I'm asking you, please, respond, let us know, email the church office, office at southsidelife.net, or call the church office, 916-647-4268. Let us know, yes, I want to come back to worship, or no, I'm content watching online until the the virus numbers drop down. Just let us know. Myself and the board are praying. We want to do what's best for all of us together, led by the Holy Spirit and not our sinful flesh. Because I miss you guys. I want you here. I've heard from some of you. I know you want to be here. But we need to do what's best for our entire body. So we want to be led humbly by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.